Welcome to episode 219 of Come On You Reds, the definitive Toronto FC podcast. I'm Gareth Wheeler with you for another week of Toronto FC banter. The show has sounded a little bit different over recent weeks. We had some great guests as we kind of converted these podcasts into Touchline Talks. I had Ralph Prizo join me. Alex Bono was great last weekend. If you haven't checked it, make sure you do. We play rapid fire with Alex Bono. We might have to add it to this show, the standard Come On You Reds, and we can maybe do that maybe next week with our very own Terry Dunfield, who makes his triumphant return from the pod. He's missed four TFC matches. and know that you've been waiting to hear his thoughts about Toronto FC's performance and some of the movement and happenings within the squad, and he's back with us here on Come On You Reds today. What's going on, Dunfield? Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, it's great to be back. Uh, great work with Ralph and, and Alex. Thanks for the shout outs and feeling much better. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, look, on a scale of one to 10, how much have you missed me? Just seeing your face and your voice. It's, uh, it's like I'm at home, man. I, I knew that you were feeling better because I got a text over the weekend and said, hey, are we going to go <laughs> golfing this week? <laughs> yeah, I'm <thinking> about <laughs> You already want to put me to shame on the golf course. Uh, T- Terry, do you want to explain why you're off for a couple of weeks? I know that we wished you well, and I, I know that people are, are concerned about people within the Toronto FC family. What were you dealing with? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I got my ass kicked by COVID for almost 11, 12 days. And uh, it, it was pretty relentless. It was like an eight and a half out of 10 every day, all night. I was in bed for probably 23 hours of the day. Uh, body was aching, a little bit of anxiety, nausea, uh, struggle to sleep, no energy. Uh, it was tough. Uh, fortunately, I had my girl Afton to look after me. She tested positive. Fortunately, she didn't have a lot of symptoms. But as I started to get better, her breathing uh, got affected a little bit. But we are able to get through it together. And um, speaking with their club doc, I think it's important to just kind of gradually build up your strength and not try to take on too much um, because you could easily kind of slip back. And, and that's what I've been doing maybe for the last week. Well, we were worried about you. You were constantly in our thoughts. Uh, It's good to see you back um, and that you're doing well. And a reminder, this is why it's so important for people to take care of themselves, go out and get vaccinated. I mean, Terry, you're younger than me, former professional athlete, in good shape. Even though you say you're not, you're in excellent shape as well. So it really can happen to anyone, can't it? It can. I guess one of the positives, I've lost 15 pounds. Have you really? Yeah, yeah. No, I've... uh, been strutting around the apartment here a bit but you know <laughs> probably my biggest takeaway is uh maybe, maybe not taking your health for granted i know um mm. maybe it's easy to say now but uh without your health you're you're in tough shape and, the, the, the physical part something but the you know my trials and tribulations battling malignant melanoma over the years you know whether it's that or covid or anything like that the physical there's a challenge there but the psychological the mental side of things as well it, it's a it's a real issue and that's got to be kind of tough to walk through as well for sure and uh i, I guess not I guess feeling like you're not going on it, going at it on your own is important. All the texts and calls and emails, it was it was great to hear from everyone, and that support was huge. But uh, some real long nights. It was it, it was funny how that affected me psychologically. That you just kind of go down some rabbit holes, and um, yeah, you kind of get lost a little bit. Well, good to have you back, Um, and you're going to be back in better than ever. There's no doubt about that. On this week's pod, we're going to get Terry's take on how things have kind of moved forward for Toronto FC in recent games, talk about some of the new additions who have joined since Terry was last on the podcast. Uh, On After 90 Minutes, after the one nothing loss to Orlando City, I brought up three issues, three decisions that the coaching staff needs to make about this team to kind of move the group forward. I'm going to ask Terry his thoughts on those, and we'll preview this weekend, 3 p.m. Eastern time, Columbus Crew, Toronto FC from the capital of Ohio. Um, so as I mentioned, Terry, you missed four games. 
Um, I'm actually kind of happy we didn't have a pod after the 2-0 loss to the Red Bulls. A difficult game, to say the least, but then TFC bounced back with a 2-0 victory over Columbus right after that. The good vibes were back in the team. You heard some of the players say that that could kickstart their season. Since that time, a difficult 1-1 draw against New York City FC, then losing to an undefeated and very good Orlando City team last Saturday. 1-0 was the final there. Overall, what are your, your takeaways of what we saw over the last you know, few games and where the team is at, in your opinion, at, at, at current time? Ooh, um, probably my biggest takeaway is uh, we're starting to get a little bit healthier. Um, I think the having a couple of weeks where we haven't had a midweek game has been important. Um, I think there's lots of learnings that we can take out of the games, which is important for growth. And hopefully we see that come playoff time. Uh, I think our team's become a little bit more senior and, and there's been less reliancy on the younger players. Um, and, and I think now Chris Armas has some star power in his squad and, and he's just figuring out how to best utilize it. And, and I think the players too need just a little bit of time to, understand their strengths, weaknesses, and, and build that chemistry. But I'd say big picture, we're, we're moving in the right direction. I thought Columbus uh, was a great team performance. I thought we caught Columbus on an off night. I thought, I thought we were engaged from minute one, whereas they tried to get going and we overpowered them. Um, I thought New York's, New York is just a crazy game on that field. And uh, I, I really felt for Alex. I thought he was exceptional. I thought he... Um, you know, it was, a, it was a difficult bounce when he'd like back, but overall his performance was solid and, and merited maybe staying in the team. Um, and, and I thought the Orlando game, just before we get into it, big picture was, as Steve said on the broadcast, a great advert for MLS. I thought it was an outstanding game. Yeah, and for me, TFC are going to be kicking themselves that they didn't come away with anything because they certainly did generate chances. Like I've, I've almost kind of stricken that Red Bulls loss from the record because that wasn't Toronto FC. They had 66% pass completion that night. Like they struggled to link three and four passes together, Terry. But since that time, I completely agree with you. I think that these have been three positive performances for Toronto FC in New York. You have to remember TFC played Columbus midweek, New York, the schedule makers did them a favor. They didn't have a midweek game. So, so Toronto FC were kind of up against it. I thought that they did well to punch back to get that point through a goal that Schaffelberg scored, but it's Jacob who misses the absolute sitter. He probably still hasn't slept that night since that miss. He must have thought that the flag went up and he was offside and maybe took his foot off it a little bit because I, I still can't believe he missed that. So Teldo was excellent. That was his best performance against Orlando City as well. And that was a game, despite playing against a very good team, who for the first time was playing in front of their own fans, that you really feel like they should have come away with something from that game. Yeah, maybe Schaffelberg just kind of had too much time to think about it and actually thought, whereas um, I, th I thought when he scored against New York City, it, it was implicit. It, it, it just was routine. It was like something off a training ground. And um, for sure, it'd be one he'd like back. I think he's got it in his locker to open up the, his hips and bend it into that far corner. And uh, I, I think if I'm Oscar Preya, I'm I, I, I get a, I think 1-1 one, one would have been probably a fair result. Yeah, at the same time, uh, Perea might have been saying Tesho Ekandeli might have had one goal. He should have had four. Bono was up for it, but also missed the target on a couple occasions as well. I'm not slagging off Schaffelberg here at all because when he came on the field, it just looked like there was more attacking intent in the team, Terry, that w when you have a natural winger playing that on, on that right side, the, the team was a little bit more dangerous. And like you said, with more and more options coming into the team, I still think there's there's a little bit where Chris Armas is figuring out where the pieces fit, especially with no Alejandro Pozuelo in the team. That's the thing that needs to be remembered. Pozuelo hasn't even, even been on the field, so it's difficult to play players as you would like without the star man, without the MVP uh, available in your team. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I, I don't think you want to be too uh, reliant on just one player. But, but I think Pozuelo is the piece that really brings our attack together and, and, and will bring pieces together and really control the tempo of our attack. Uh, somebody you can also trust in possession with the ball. 
Um, but, but I think Pozuelo in an ideal, in ideal circumstances comes into a team that's flowing and he just adds more value to it. Uh, so no, he's, uh, he's a huge loss. Look, Orlando, we're missing a couple players as well. Uh, it was tough to see Oso go off with an injury, especially with some big Canada games coming up. Hopefully he's okay. No kidding. I just didn't like the goal that TFC conceded. What did, what has Chris Armas told us, like us personally on a number of occasions, the team needs to show urgency in and around the area. It's just a ball played in behind the back line, but Vinga goes to challenge, but he doesn't get his body shape right. He kind of turns and puts his back to the player playing the ball. Omar's coming over to help. And then there's two players wide open on top of the six yard box. Like, I don't really get the critics of some of the critics of Alex Bono's play because I think he's been very good for this team. But that, that that's just a case where the defending, there isn't enough urgency to clear the lines in a position like that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, great word. I, I agree with everything. Um, and, and I think that's something Orlando City had in abundance. They Whenever TFC got in and around their box or to good areas, there was players flying out to block tackles. There was cover. I, I don't think we really opened them up where he had a clear look at goal just because of the, the defending of, of Orlando. And um, I, I think the goal is, is is one maybe we'd like back, but you also got to give a little bit of credit to Orlando, not to sit on the fence too much. But um, I think the way we we're set up to defend is, is we've got this net and, and we want to lock the opposition on one side. And Orlando did really well to play across the field. We were a little bit late a couple of times to, to lock them into one side and also stop forward progress. And as you said, it led to a 1v1 situation with Chris Mavinga being drawn out of the box. And as soon as he's drawn out, you're, you're almost in a numbers down situation. Orlando had five guys in the box. And I think if I'm a center back and I leave home, let's call it, um, I, I've really got to stop that cross. And uh Van der Water. Van der Water. Yeah. yeah uh, I, I think he's a tricky customer. He can kind of go either way and uh, he decides to cut inside. Omar kind of shifts across into that near post space where Mavinga would be. And, and what should happen in a perfect world is uh, at the back post, Richard Larea comes across. He's caught out wide. And, and it's almost like you could, there's just tons of space in that six yard box. And uh, it's, it's a, Pretty easy header for Akinheli. Just, just look at the way that Orlando defended Soteldo the other way. And I want to get into his play. But he had two and three players going after him with, like, intent. Like, <laughs> on him hard, Terry. And then there was players in was support like, to yeah. clean up any mess behind. Like, that. that's just what I'm not seeing from Toronto FC defensively. I, I'm not sure if the players are in their heads. They're just trying to make the right decision. But sometimes your instincts need to take over and just close down time and space much quicker. For sure. It was like watching David Attenborough or something. How he <laughs> the hyenas on him. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's partially due to the guys just learning a new system, a new style of play. And um, that sometimes costs you time when you're thinking about it. And hopefully as the year progresses, I will be a little bit sharper with that. But um, yeah, I think so. So Taldo, that was his kind of breakout game to the fans and showed his teammates as well what he can do. And um, he, at times, he was unplayable. It was, uh, you're thinking there's no way he can get to the byline and get across it. And, and, he, and he seems to do it. Um, and, and I think it'll just we spoke about it team chemistry is it'll take just a little while for his teammate for for his teammates to time his runs off him cover areas in the box know when that final execution is going to come and I, I thought it was a little bit difficult for the guys to just time their runs off him or know when he's okay this is enough pressure he's got so many bodies around him let's find a numerical superiority on the other side of the field but you, but, but you have to know if you make the run you will be rewarded and the, the, the case in point that I wanted to bring up was when he was down c cutting in across from the touchline he was taken down he bounced back up on his feet Altidore was making a slow run into the area and Josie got upset that the ball wasn't played to him. But if he makes that run with intent, if he's on his bike, then Soteldo is going to put his head up. But if he sees a guy kind of running into that space, like taking the right direction, but not showing that urgency. Again, the word urgency, he's not going to play them the ball. So that's why I don't even blame Soteldo for trying to take that effort on goal. Like if you run, if you work, you're going to be rewarded. 
Yeah, that was uh, it was a great ball into the channel. I'm not sure who, who played it, but Saltado almost made a play out of nothing. It was a, it was a great little bit of skill to flick it over the keeper, and uh, the angle wasn't quite on to to slot maybe like Tejon Buchanan did on the weekend. And I didn't quite see the cutback to Josie Altador, and and maybe in a moment like that, it it, it helps if you've got another two three bodies in the box. But the fact I think maybe one or two gave up on it that. It looked as though he was 2080 um, to, to actually get there and make something. And it's one of those moments as a player. Oh, the one yeah. time I don't make a run, he's, he's, Saltello's in a good spot. Wouldn't you have hated defending him as a player in your career? <laughs> like, I'm just thinking as a former defender myself, because he's so, he's so compact that when he kind of turns over the ball and then turns right back the other direction, I mean, we've seen players fall down on their ass, like based upon those moves. Cause it's so quick. It almost happens so fast. It's very difficult to defend. And although he doesn't have the length, he's able to manipulate and earn that a little bit of extra space that's needed for him to, to, to cut the ball back or play it across. It's unbelievable to watch. Yeah. He's so much fun to watch. And I, I'd like to see him pick the ball up maybe a couple times uh, at pace or where he makes like a slashing run, like Schaffberg quite often he picks it up and he's got, he's, he's picking it up against a set defense and he's now got to unbalance him on his own. But as you said, he can go either way. He'll create an overload on his own a little bit like Raheem Sterling. And it looks like he's got a, a little bit of final quality where he can dig out a cross. I'm excited to see him cut inside sometimes and uh, unleash that shot we've seen in Brazil. Just waiting for that first one to go. Then you know that whether it's goals, assists, they're going to come for that player. Uh, Toronto FC welcomed two other players into the team since we last chatted. Let's start with left back Kamar Lawrence. What do you know about him? What have you liked? What have you seen from him thus far? Ooh, good one. Um, from what I've seen, I, I, I think it's exactly what we expected. Um, I think you've got a reliable player. You know exactly what you're going to get from him. Um, he's tough to play against. He, he, he's very good defensively. Um, I'd imagine in a perfect world, he'd like to get forward a little bit more, but what we've seen is Saltado drift wide and there's not maybe a lane for him to, um, kind of overlap. Maybe there's some opportunity at times to underlap, but yeah. I've seen just a very reliable player in, in all moments of the game. Well, that's kind of what we saw against uh, in the win over Columbus. All of a sudden, TFC, right near the end of the half, changed their formation. It pushed Auro forward. And then you started to see players underlap rather than overlap. Potentially, that's the way that Toronto FC kind of looks to manipulate space a little bit more, be a little bit less predictable, Terry. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one because... Um... I think you want divergent thinkers and, and, and players that can see space and capitalize on it. And uh, I think that Chris Armas's system is, is more kind of on the convergent side and, okay, this is how we're going to play. These are the spaces we're going to occupy and we're going to create overload centrally. And I think over the last couple of games, um, our attacking shape has kind of naturally um, run its run its course. And uh, I think for fullbacks, the space has been kind of, Maybe, as you said, that underlap. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting situation to manage now, having two very good full left backs in Moro. Like, how do you get him into the team? Um, we've seen Auro kind of find a spot in midfield, as you said recently, uh, to just keep him on the field. He's such a good player. But it's, uh, it's tricky trying to fit everybody in now for Chris Armas. I'm going to get into that in a few moments' time. Uh, the other signing for Toronto FC, Dom Dwyer, a very experienced MLS striker, uh, effective on his day, was injured for the vast majority of last season. Uh, he's going to look for a run of games as well. What do you make of the Dwyer signing, adding potentially some more goals into this team where, for me, Terry, it was just essential that they did bring in a player that can provide some more goals for them? Yeah, it, it uh, adds definitely more competition to that number nine spot. Um, and, and I think that that's important. It led to Peruzza going to San Antonio. But I he think scored. Peruzza yeah, scored on his, yeah, uh, on his, yeah. going back to San Antonio. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think for Chris Armas, it was, I think he sees a similar player to him back in the day. Uh, someone that works hard, all action, can score 
can create something out of nothing, works hard defensively. So I think it hits home a little bit with him, just kind of how he was as a player. I think you're signing a motivated player um, that, that's coming off an injury, hasn't had a club, had to trial. And I think he, he comes in with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder to prove to everyone that he's still a, a top number nine in this league. So I'd say his motivation's high. Uh, one of the risks maybe of, of signing a player off an injury is the other knocks that you kind of pick up. Um, and, and I think it's important that the medical team and, and Chris Arm is kind of, I think he's the personality that wants to play every minute, wants to be the hero, wants to, to, to get it done, that, that you need to just kind of ease him in. Um, so, so in the long run that he's, he's just available. Uh, the way that I, I, I believe I, I, I um, characterize the Dwyer signing. It's an insurance policy with an opportunity to be so much more than that. I, I just look at the fitness over the last few years of Josie Altador, his inability to stay in the team. You need to have top backups. It's, Iowa Akinola, you know, really last year was his first year of any prominence. Uh, he could go off and play for Canada at the Gold Cup and potentially miss some time. That could be a realistic possibility, um, you know, and then you have Patrick Mullins. That's who you're left with. Like you need strength in numbers in those attacking positions and players that can score goals. I think with Dwyer, you're confident that if called upon, that there isn't going to be a massive dip in terms of uh, in terms of output up top. For sure. And then you've got a player too that knows the league inside out. I think he's different to Mullins, Io, and Josie, where where if you really want to put some pressure on a back line, you can you can throw him in. I think he's he's a good sub as well. But just kind of knowing his personality, I think he'll want more than that. Just one win through six games. I know that has some people panicking. Perhaps you could walk us through as a player playing in Major League Soccer where there's no promotion relegation. Oftentimes it takes you eight, nine games to kind of get a feel of what your team is all about. Things are entirely congested in the Eastern Conference as well. Um, what's your take? I know they're in 12th on five points, but a win on the weekend can take them up into the top six. Um, so some you know pr- perspective is needed there. Uh, what do you make of that? I'd say three of the six games you could probably mitigate and, and kind of going into those games that you knew you were in tough shape. I think you've got a new coach and, and you're, you're learning a new style of play. Uh, I think it's a bit of a blow to your ego and to a team that's had so much success. It, it, it's new. They're not used to kind of being at the bottom of the table. But in, in situations like this, I think it's important that you don't chase plays, chase results, um, that, that you continue to focus on the process. and. Um, how we can come together be, and, and be the best team. And I think we've seen that against Columbus. I thought against Orlando, we were, we, we were solid um, and, and, and just continue to tidy things up. I'm still withholding judgment uh, until we see Pozuelo in this team. And then we can see what this group actually is all about and what they can be and the hope. And we'll get into it a little bit later on is that the player returns uh, sooner rather than later. Before I go on to, to, to some decisions that needed need to be made um, uh, by the coaching staff to take this team forward, I shout out for, uh, for TFC2, the first game in what seems to be an eternity. They're playing in Arizona. They won their first match against North Texas in USL. League 1-2-1 one, one was the final. Garrett McLaughlin is the USL League 1 Player of the week. He scored a brace despite TFC not having a whole lot of possession in that game. If you're wondering who Garrett McLaughlin is, well, TFC just picked him up. He was drafted in the MLS Super Draft by Houston eighth overall in 2020. So it seems like they might have given up on the player a little little bit early. And maybe a a chance that Toronto FC is giving them with TFC too for the player to go in and make an impression. Did you watch, Terry, your thoughts? Because, you know, we all know how near and dear the academy and the second team is to your heart. Of course I did. Big shout out to Mike Munoz, who's uh, steering the ship. He's done a wonderful job. It's it's been over 600 days since they played last. It's great. Uh, club legend Danny Dicchio's uh, assisting them, and uh, I thought overall it was it was a great team performance. The team spirit throughout could be seen. The the young guys were, um, I think they were just happy to be out there playing. I think they're playing with a point to prove. I thought they defended really well. Um, very similar to how Chris Armas sets up the first team. 
Uh, a couple young academy kids were excellent. Kosi Thompson, Kobe Franklin, who played uh, for Canada at the U17 World Cup. Um, so, yeah, there were, there was some good performances. Some of the veteran players, I say veteran, they were 23, someone like McLaughlin came in and gave a little bit of experience and two chances, two goals. They need to play. And this is the underlying story is so many players throughout not only the Toronto FC Academy, but the youth system of development in this country are not playing regular games. This is a step in the right direction. And this needs to pick up in the coming weeks and months. So um, the players stay inspired, motivated and stay on track to pursue their professional ambitions as well. Well said. Big shout out to Bill Manning, too, for finding a way to make it work. They're, they're down in Arizona, based at Casa Grande. They'll be there for maybe six weeks before joining up with the first team in Florida. But it's uh, I'm sure it's not cheap, but it's so important for the players' development. And yeah, Hopefully we'll see them back up here with the first team in the not-so-distant future as well. All right, Terry, uh, let's pivot here. And there are clear issues that need to be resolved in the team and um, how big of an issue they are. I mean, that's up for you, the listener, the viewer to determine, but these are three pressing decisions that need to be made in the team from where I sit. And I'm sure you out there have other decisions that you think should be analyzed and assessed throughout the Toronto FC first team as well. So are you ready for it? I'm going to, I'm going to go one through three, Terry, and I want to get your take. Um, The first thing that needs to be resolved in this group is where to play Marky Delgado. We know what an important player, Del, or Mark Delgado, I should say. Um, we, we all know what an important role Delgado has played in Toronto FC's team in recent years. And he's still a very young, productive player. But in my personal opinion, I don't think that TFC is getting the best out of him playing him on the right side of the midfield in an advanced role. I think that you just need a player with more attacking intent, more attacking prowess in that role to get the most out of Marky and the team. And when Mark drops back and plays in central midfield, and we've seen that in recent games, I think you're getting more out of him when he's playing a role that he's more suited towards and more familiar with. Now, I understand why he's playing up there. You want your best players in the team. When you press and Delgado can press and defend with the best of them, there's advantages to be gained there. But I think in the overall game model of Toronto FC, you might need a player of a different um, skill set, a different type of player, occupy that role rather than Delgado. Uh, what do you make of that in that decision that, for me, is one that needs to be analyzed? Yeah, it's... Uh... I think as from a player, if I put my player's hat on, I, I think players want to be comfortable. When, the, when that team sheet comes up, you're like, okay, here's where I play. I know what I'm doing. And, and it suits my skill set. And uh, I think Mark, Mark will take on whatever role is given to him. I, I think he's that type of player. I think he's a facilitator. And, and he'll do, as, as, as Chris has said, to the best of his ability. Um, I think the thinking behind, and, and you touched on most of it, him playing kind of in a more advanced right kind of inner channel role is he moves the ball quickly. Uh, um, he has the capacity to press when it's on. Um, you know, I still think you're connected to that midfield too, where, where you can have that relationship. I think, I think he's got the ability to run past the front line and, and uh, create problems that way. Um, but, but I think what's happened quite often is he's, he's almost been pushed out right out by that touch line. And uh, that, that's kind of limited some of his options in, in possession. Um, and, and it's something new to him. And I, th- and I think you just need more reps to become comfortable there. I think when he has come into midfield wheels, it's been a little bit um, when we're chasing a game or, or you know, it's a tough yes. environment in that moment. He's a little bit isolated because Michael's really high. Um, so, so it's hard to, to kind of maybe assess him in, in a midfield two at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'd agree. I think he's, when you look at the team sheet, maybe one that you're like, oh, I don't know if this is a perfect fit for him. Right. And it might be in a more, in a deeper lying role alongside Michael Bradley. And it, they just need to sort out that area of the field because I think it's also affecting Richie Lorea and his ability to attack as well. Uh, we haven't seen Lorea getting forward nearly enough in a player that can cause all kinds of problems when he does. And I think that's just symptomatic of maybe a player 
in Delgado playing out of position and just it not being as free flowing as it could be in that role. And I think that when Delgado drops, it probably gives the fullback Lorea a little bit more confidence that he can go forward and that position will be covered as well. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think for Richie, uh, a little bit more sustained possession in the attacking third will allow him to get forward. I think we've been pretty vertical and it, it's tough for him to, to, to know exactly when to join the attack. And, uh, you, you know, you're also giving something up. If it, now all of a sudden your center back's a bit isolated and it's tough to get back. But um, again, again, nuances of the game that we're figuring out right now. And um, I, I think Chris is just finding the right kind of chains or units or combinations. Absolutely. None of this is e- easy. None of this is straightforward. Um, my, my next issue or decision that needs to be made is kind of along the same lines because it influences who plays in the midfield alongside Michael Bradley. And we've seen Arrow Jr. the last two games play that position. But for me, Terry, Arrow and Richie make up the best fullback pairing in all of major league soccer. They're arguably the best or one of the best at their respected positions. I understand you're bringing in Kamar Lawrence. I understand that he needs to play and he's a very good option in his own right. But I think I'd prefer Auro to play his natural fullback position rather than trying to play him in a position he's less familiar with in order to kind of um, get him on the field. I think there's enough games to be had. There's a ton of games to be played that you can provide a different role for all of those fullbacks, depending on the matchup, depending on who you're playing. And even along those same lines, if there's a player that's probably more comfortable moving forward up the field, it might be a Richie Larea playing a more advanced role where Delgado's playing and Arrow can play his natural right-sided role. I just think there's multiple ways that you can kind of deploy players, but we'll play them in a position that will play to their strengths. Sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, I think the maybe the thinking behind Armis putting Auro in midfield is he's comfortable in possession. He's he kind of protects space extremely well defensively. He can play that role. He can play that role. Absolutely, Terry. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure it's a it's a long term solution. And and it's a way, as you said, to to get him into the team. I like having a left footer. Uh, down the left-hand side. I think a couple of the goals we've conceded is because we've had a right footer playing left back and they've kind of checked back and, and that's led, led to a turnover and problems. So I, I'd, I'd imagine moving forward, I think Chris will have Morrow and Lawrence on the left and you've got Richie and Auro duking it out on the right. And, and depending on the opposition too, what, which player is the best fit for who we're playing against. Right. It, and I, I think that that midfield makeup is so important. We're seeing uh, much more leash on Michael Bradley to go forward, uh, be a force going both ways. But I think it's having a knock on effect. Some of the chances that were given up on the weekend when Michael in recent years has, has, has been a little bit more defensively responsible in terms of the team shape, it's allowed the fullbacks to cover some of those balls that are played deeper um, when he's almost playing almost as a three at times. He's not playing that role at all this year. So I just think that Bradley and whoever he plays with, I, I still think that that Chris might be looking for the perfect match, the perfect complementary player. And I'm not sure he's hit on it as of yet. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah there's a little bit of complexity to that because in, in Michael, I, I think – you've got one or I know you've got one of the best midfielders in the league and, and he's so influential to how TFC play. Um, and, and I think in recent weeks we've seen him actually kind of do a little bit of everything. We've seen him kind of drop back into, into the back line to help the team progress. He's up the field, he's pressing, he's trying to make plays and be creative. Um, it's a fair bit, especially when you have two games a week and, and, and by doing so much, I know he's got a huge capacity. Um, you know, maybe it takes a little bit away from your execution. If I heard Chris Armas say his numbers in training every day are the highest, his numbers are the highest on the pitch for distance covered, high intensity runs. Um, is, is, is how do you really get the, the best out of Michael? And I think Chris Armas has prioritized his attacking attributes and having him higher up the field. So I think you need a little bit of a defensive minded. Uh, player to almost compliment him. And uh, I, I think Ralph Prizzo's done a pretty good job. I think Auro's um, been, been fine in there. 
Um, but yeah, I think finding that right combination is going to be important for the team. And a lot of midfields, a lot of teams set up with three in midfield. It's not easy playing as a two once no. kind of the opposition get past that front line. You, you're now having to deal with the 10. You've got two holders. You're a little bit overloaded in the Completely agree with you on that. My final point that uh, needs to be analyzed is whether Josie Altidore should be starting games for Toronto FC. And the question sounds ridiculous to ask because when he's on his game, he's a top player, he's a DP, he's a moneymaker, he's got the resume. We saw him score a goal against Columbus, absolutely rocket blast one off the bar as well. When he's what is what a ridiculous strike because when Josie is at his best, uh, few are better in major league soccer. But I would argue he's not at full strength yet, he's not at full fitness, whether that injury set him back or what have you. When Altador started games, he hasn't been at his best. When he came off the bench against Columbus, he was excellent. And what did we see against Orlando when that double change was made? Schaffelberg, Akinola came on the field. They created a chance within 30 seconds. Io's hold-up play has been excellent. His willingness to run in behind the back line is something that TFC is lacking to a certain degree. I think it's worthy to consider whether Io Akinola might be a better fit to start for this group over the short term until Josie's fully fit or proves himself to be able to play that kind of role. What are your thoughts on that? It's a difficult decision to make. You're going to put me back to my sleepless nights here, man. Um, <laughs> I, I think some credit has to be given to Josie uh, for, for almost the, the work he put into the game. And, and the game's now a little bit open for Schaffelberg and Io to come on or Mullins and, and make a difference. So there's something to be said for that. Uh, the last couple of times I've seen Josie play, I've seen a player uh, engaged. I've seen a player... Um, a little bit fitter. I don't think the number 10 role works. I think he's got the qualities to come off the back line and play between lines, but to kind of live in there, I thought he, he against New York city struggled to, to really find, find a lot of touches. And I, th I thought he became a little bit frustrated. I know it's a tiny pitch, but to, to answer your question, I'd say uh, he's the main man. And, and, and there's a big difference between being Batman and Robin and, uh, I, I'd say he needs five games. He needs a run of games. Uh, I know we've got the international break coming up, but, uh, you know, I, I, I trust him. And, and, and I'd, I'd analyze him after five games, not just kind of in for one game, playing as a 10, uh, coming off an injury. I'd, uh, I'd see if we can get him to five games. And then I think once you kind of get to five games, you, you should be good to go. But that's a big, big kind of looking at his history. Can we get him to five games? Yeah, that th there's a number of factors, um, uh, you know, at stake here. I, I'm with you. I think that um, based on what you can get out of him, you need to give him that run of games. I entirely appreciate that. But I always played well. And, and this is the thing, like, these are younger legs, a, a hungry player that at this stage, there's certain players that you can get more of them when they play 30 minutes rather than 60. So it's how you distribute those minutes, right? What's going to be best for the team right now? It's not what's just what's best for Josie Altador. What's best for Toronto FC? And, and, and I'm not quite sure. I'm making the case to start potentially start IO, but I'm not completely sold on that either. I just, these are all decisions that I think are worthwhile discussions that are worthwhile to have because you need Altador at his best. Over the last two games against New York and Orlando, was this vintage Josie Altador? Was this a difference maker in that position? I would say no, Terry. But coming off the bench against Columbus, what did we see? Josie being a difference maker, being a real influence on the way that that game finished. And that's the Josie that Toronto FC desperately needs, especially with no Pozuelo in the team. Sure. Yeah. I'd say it's too, the, the guys are still figuring themselves out. They're figuring out the system. And I think there's more to it uh, than ju just looking at one individual. Um, and, and I think Chris Armas would love to play Josie and Io together maybe at some point, but I think both of them are just a little bit short on, on Matt sharpness and, he, and he's just trying to top them up right now. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, let us know your um, 
you know, your decisions, what you think needs to be looked at for Toronto FC. We're happy to share your thoughts on this podcast each and every week. Uh, just a couple of minutes left here, Terry. Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Eastern time, Columbus, Toronto. Columbus has changed their name, still the same logo since the two sides last played. A little bit of bone of contention, and this more so goes to Major League Soccer. Um, who've generally done a great job getting this season off the ground. It's been great to see full stadiums, exciting games. The standard of play continues to rise. I do not know why three games are being played at 3 p.m. this Saturday at the exact same time as your beloved Manchester City is finally in a Champions League final, taking on Chelsea. You're asking soccer fans to make a decision. You know, you're going to watch... One or the other. Sure, you can go back and watch another on PVR or not watch one live, but that live game experience is something I think all sports fans prefer. Just you could have put that game any other time. It can start at five. It can start at seven, like just 3 p.m. at the same time as a Champions League game. It's forcing you, Terry, to double screen it. You're going to be watching TFC and City at the same time. I'll be... uh... All for one, man. I'll record the city game and try my best not to look at my phone. But lies, you're I know. city in a Champions know. League final. Hold on, I'll I'll be watching TFC and it's 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 uh yeah, it's just a tough one that I think that you've known when the Champions League final is for a long time that you'd um, consider going head to head with that, and I'm not sure the reasons why, but. I think two players like night games. We've, we've had a lot of day games yes. in Florida, which has been tough on quick turnaround as well. But hopefully the schedule will improve. And, um, you know, it's, it was tough even the other night. We went head-to-head with the Leafs. It's, uh, you, you know, we're trying to still yes. build a game here in Toronto and, and we're trying to convert some of the sports fans to soccer fans. Uh, the more we see it on various platforms, the better. Good point on that. Um, by the way, you acknowledging that you're going to wait to watch the City game later tells me you're not confident and you actually think that Chelsea is going to go on and win the Champions oh, League. Horrible. So. <laughs> <laughs> Tuchel's being found out. Tell everyone. Uh, you mentioned that you didn't think Columbus was on the top of their game last time they played, yet they won last weekend. Lucas Zellerayan, MLS Player of the Week for Week 6. Uh, Are you expecting a different Columbus this time out? Yeah, I think Caleb Porter is, uh, is a proud man. Um, I'm sure he won't want what happened last time to happen again. I thought we just had too much quality. Our our structure was great. Uh, We played through them very easily, created a ton of chances. Um, And and I think maybe Columbus, uh, I don't know, maybe took us lightly. Uh, so I ex- expect a similar kind of game to the Orlando game, to be honest. We'll see about Azorio and Gonzalez. Both players came off, looked to be hurt. I think Azorio is more of a worry, Terry, because he'd been battling a hamstring injury. Uh, perhaps Omar's was a little bit more of a cramp. That's what Ralph Prizo dealt with a couple weeks ago when it looked like he'd done his hamstring. So I guess to this point, you keep your fingers crossed. My question is, if Pozuelo is good to go, understanding that it's been a process, it's been complicated getting him back. Do you play him this weekend or do you give the player an extra couple of weeks understanding that after this game, it's the international break and TFC don't play again until June 19th? Uh, I'd try to get him 20 minutes and, and yeah. uh, it's probably where my head would go. I think expecting him to, to, to start might be a little bit much and, and orchestrate things from the beginning. I'd also be worried about losing him uh, long-term and, and know you've got a couple weeks coming up to continue to build his fitness. Well, because you have games 19th, 23rd of June, 26th of June, July 3rd, July 7th. It's hectic in the build-up to the Gold Cup. Those are going to be a critical five-game stretch coming out of the international break where you need all of your best players, and that absolutely includes Alejandro Pozuelo. Good stuff, Terry. Good to have you back. You felt good? Are you, are you not fatigued? How are you feeling? Oh, I'm good, thanks. I'm good, thanks. I'm uh, excited to just get back into the routine and get, get back after it. Good stuff. Uh, We all have your back, buddy. Um, I want to thank Terry. I want to thank our producer, Erica, as well. And for you, uh, for listening to our podcast or watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to either. Keep on supporting us as we keep on supporting your Reds from afar. I am Gareth Wheeler, and this is Being Come On You Reds.